Well, I'd like to welcome our guests uh, here in the studios, um, actually presidential candidate uh, for the uh, November elections in the United States, Mr. Merlin Miller. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, now, you, you. You've just seen that clip uh, that we were looking at uh, that uh, as our, uh, the person who's doing the voiceover said could be funny or perhaps as an American you might look at it in a different way because we saw with that clip the absolute influence, would you say, of uh, the Zionist entity on American politics? I firmly believe both political parties are controlled by Zionist interest, and uh, these candidates were basically picked by global elites long ago, and the whole process was a, is a sham, basically, to get them in positions. And, and the funding is there, the media support is there, and the American public is not the wiser for it. Okay, so you are a presidential candidate. Now, what exactly does that mean? Because we, we know that we have the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, and basically that is it, and the United States is for its making. So when you say that you're running for uh, the presidential election, do you think you have a chance of winning? Or tell me exactly what you want to do by running. What are you trying to? No, absolutely no, no chance whatsoever. Nobody knows who we are yet. Uh, we're trying to build a movement as an alternative to the two-party system. Uh, the two-party system is such a corrupt system right now, it's totally dependent on huge sums of money. The party platforms are controlled by global elites. Uh, neither party represents the interests of the American people anymore. Uh, we feel there's a need for a grassroots movement to develop, to actually have political representation for America's middle class, Americans working people who have no representation anymore. Uh, I was actually recruited by this party and very reluctant because pol politics are not my ambition. Uh, but I decided ultimately to go ahead and join their effort. Uh, we've modified the platform a little bit, but it's pretty much in line with Ron Paul's platform uh, with a few stronger positions, one against uh, illegal immigration because we're concerned with all the job loss from multinational corporations moving factories offshore away from America and with an invasion of illegal immigrants that's just causing tremendous uh, economic hardship to a lot of families in America. So we are opposed to that. We're definitely opposed to these wars. We want to bring our troops home right away. Uh, a lot of economic concerns, a lot of things need to be done to get America back on track with its finances. But Where's your platform? Because uh, you may have a, a certain uh, program or agenda, but basically, if it's not getting out, if your message isn't getting out, I, I want to look at the mainstream media, the corporate media right now in the United States. Do you think you have a chance at all of getting your message across via the corporate media? Not the corporate media at all. No, it's, it's purely the internet and word of mouth. There are several patriot groups that are growing, and, and I think these patriot groups are very concerned as we are, and hopefully they will support our effort, if, if not our particular party right now, uh, perhaps the growth of a, a coalition effort. Maybe there are several parties could come together, a new party could emerge that could be seriously funded. And if we get some decent funding, then I think you'll see some, some effort to penetrate the mainstream media. Uh, we're on the ballot in a few states with the prospects of getting some media coverage with the little funds that we have in those states. So uh, it's one step at a time. It's, it's a long way off before we're a, a viable force, but it's a beginning. What about the criticism that some of the patriot groups and even of yourself um, as we search on the Internet, uh, your name, for example, uh, there's criticism. They're saying that uh, you're racist, uh, segregationist. Um, tell me, where did that come from exactly? Well, in my opinion, it originated from my criticism of Zionism, of uh, Jewish control of our media, of our foreign policy, which is uh, Israel first rather than America first. I had those criticisms and then was attacked on past associations I had with conservative groups. Now, these conservative platforms were not racist. Now, there may be some white nationalists involved in these movements, as, as you find in, in any movement, but our position is strictly based on what's best for the American people, and uh, it's not racist. My Wikipedia bio, uh, I've tried to change two or three times now. Within a day or two, it reverts back. Uh, they've gone so far as to say that uh, I have a white-only film company. Uh, I'm the only employee in the company. Uh, on all Makes my it white only, huh? Yes, <laughs> all my films, I've hired the best for every part, every role. Uh, the last motion picture, the co-star was black, the editor was Puerto Rican, and uh, that's never been an issue with me. I, I believe we treat everybody as individuals. 
I am opposed to affirmative action. I think that's very destructive for the black community as well as the white community, and it's unconstitutional, it's unfair. But because of those positions, and primarily because of my opposition to Zionist power, is why they're trying to brand me as something that I'm not. And uh, I hope to clear the air on that, but uh, it's, it's a difficult process to overcome. You just mentioned, uh, as far as being opposed to Zionist power, uh, let's look at the ramifications. When someone stands up against Zionism, in the United States, um, especially if it's someone perhaps well known. Um, do they have a chance of really getting their word out or can they be basically a product of character assassination? I mean, what are the results of taking a strong stance against Zionism in the United States? Uh, there's actually zero tolerance for anybody to be anti-Zionist. Uh, you know, whether they're a, a personality like a Mel Gibson, whether there's a CNN host like a Rick Sanchez, whoever they might be, should they come out in any way opposed to the actions of, say, Israel or the Zionist lobbies, uh, they're gone. And uh, there's, there's no toleration there. And, and that is certainly not the country that America used to be. And uh, we need to find ways to develop alternative medias. And I'm so proud to see Press TV doing what you're doing because it's a voice for truth and the world needs truths right now uh, so we can stop all of these wars of aggression and, and all of these evil things that are destroying our world economically and, and, and damaging our people. Yes, we hope so. Um, well, let's look at in general, for example, you're saying with the situation right now with the whole um, Zionist entity that, that happens in the United States. That's We just saw a, a clip earlier that at the Democratic Convention, and, and they were saying themselves it takes two-thirds, two-thirds of the um, a, a votes, a positive vote to actually put it on the platform. Jerusalem should be the capital of Israel. And Obviously, it was from the, uh, the sounds that we heard, the vocal, that it was not two-thirds. But at the end, it said, okay, it has passed. Is that basically how it is done in the United States? There is a Zionist agenda, and no matter what or whom opposes it, it's going f f forward as planned. It's true. I mean, it was obvious to me that that was just abuse of the system. You know, that uh, platform position should not have passed. It should not have ever been posed why that should be an issue for a party platform. And just as Republicans marginalized Ron Paul out of the campaign, changed their campaign or their election rules or platform position rules, uh, just a, a, a deviation from anything that should be fair. And they did it designed to keep their people in. Uh, if somebody should ever go against Zionist interest in the next election, uh, they're gone and all the money goes to their, their opposition. So uh, it's, it's just sad for me to see that our representatives are just, uh, they're bought. They're, they're lap dogs for the Zionist lobbies and that's why we have career politicians. They stay there forever because they're owned. We need to get back to the traditions of the American Constitution and have our representatives be there for just a short period of time, go back to their constituencies so they truly represent their areas and not these special interest groups. Do you think inside of the United States today that it is easier for politicians or others to criticize American policy than to criticize Israel? Oh yes, uh, uh, there's no toleration for criticism of Israel. Uh, American policy, of course, in my opinion, especially foreign policy, reflects the, the Zionist lobby's wishes. And uh, these wars, uh, they're, they're fabricated for the most part. The war on terror is a giant construct, in my opinion, uh, engineered to create animosities between the Christian community and the Islamic community uh, to get these full wars, which benefit the international bankers, uh, which benefit the Zionist interests in the Middle East. Um, I, it's sad to say, and, uh, but I, I do believe that a lot of events in history have been caused, uh, false flag events we call them, which are blamed on somebody else just to create these divisions. Uh, an insidious evil game and we need to find ways to stand up and stop it. And you're actually in the process of trying to, uh, you want to make a movie and dealing with false flags uh, incidents. Uh, do you think you would be able to make that movie inside the United States? Uh, no way. I've, I've written the screenplay a couple of years ago. There's no interest whatsoever out of the Hollywood establishment, and uh, projects have been attempted in years past. But uh, now I met a survivor from the U.S. Liberty several, about 10 years ago, and it began a quest for me of seeking out truce. And the result was this screenplay now that is so critically important to get produced. Uh, because it connects not only what happened to the USS Liberty in 1967, but how that altered our foreign policy and in essence America was taken over in that intervening time. 
and 9-11. Uh, there's a lot of questions about 9-11 being a false flag attack that uh, was not committed by Osama bin Laden. False flag by whom? Who do you think uh, was In my opinion, it? it was the Mossad orchestrated event with considerable inside help. And uh, this is betrayal of the American people. It's treasonous. And I hope that we can get to the root of it and get a real investigation of the events of 9-11. Uh, so that we can stop these wars and, and certainly not foment a new false flag against Iran. And that's what this story is about, about a journalist who gets involved in researching and he connects what happened then to what's going on today and ultimately has to go underground to prevent the war on terror from becoming World War III. And uh, it's a love story, with plenty of action. We, we tailored it to be commercial so people would want to see it so we can reach mainstream audiences if we're successful and, and bring our truths, bring the story elements to life in such a way that people can learn these things without watching, say, documentaries or internet programs, but hopefully in mainstream. Right. And you talked about, uh, just now you just mentioned about um, Iran and false flag operations. We, we hear a lot now in the mainstream media just about every day about Israel and attacking Iran and attacking Iran. You are a former American military person. Um, let's look at this. Do you think that the U.S. military actually supports an attack on Iran or do you think it's being initiated in Tel Aviv? Oh, I think it's definitely originating Tel Aviv. They're pressuring in every way they can to get our forces committed to another war for Israel to be fought by Americans at American expense. Uh, criminal, evil. Uh, we are fortunately starting to see some senior military officers question this. People in our intelligence community are, are seriously questioning this. I hope there's an awakening of patriots a mass awakening that can stand up and say, I'm going to do my duty to the United States Constitution. I swore an oath to protect against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And I think that process is underway. I, I certainly hope so. But the American public does not know the facts. They've been fed a, a steady diet of lies. And uh, it's, it's put us on the precipice. America's in serious trouble right now. And what will it take? to get this information out. You said that the American population really do not know the reality of what is happening. What does it take to inform the American population? Well, at this stage, since we have no mainstream media presence, it just takes the persistence of alternative media. Uh, and, and press TV is having an impact. You've got a lot of internet sources. You've also got this film festival, which I'm proud to be a part of here in Tehran. And uh, it's a bridge between cultures, but it's also a forum to, ha to have filmmakers be able to develop and produce their own products, which can hopefully make a difference. Okay, we're just about at the end of the program, but this is your uh, first trip to Iran, correct? Yes, it is. Okay, I, very briefly, I'd like to know expectations uh, b before arriving here, and so far that you've been here, what have you found? Well, I did not believe the U.S. mainstream media's portrayal of Iranians, which would be as terrorists and you know, people that are despicable. Uh, but I didn't have the highest expectations, and I've been pleasantly surprised. The Iranian people have been warm and, and hospitable to me, a, a beautiful people, a beautiful country, and I want to do what I can to preserve peace and, and get truce back to the American people. And it's a difficult process, but it's got to be done. Okay. Well, best of luck in that endeavor. Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Merlin Miller, Thank U.S. You. presidential candidate. Thank you.